Welcome to another episode of the MMA Lock Cast. I'm your host, Manpreet, a.k.a. MMA Lock of the Night, your boy on social media at MMALOTN, and the architect behind the MMA Fight Archive, which has now surpassed 3,400 fighter profiles for you guys to research from and ensure you leave no stone unturned when you're researching these upcoming MMA events. This weekend, we got five events, including the UFC. We got PFL on Thursday, LFA, KSW, and Cage Warriors also all going down this weekend. I'll be researching them and dropping breakdowns for you guys as well. And the only way I'm able to do so so effectively and efficiently is through the MMA Fight Archive. I have direct links for all fights, for most fights, for all of these competitors on these upcoming cards uh, listed on this uh, service for you guys. So you can just quickly click on whatever fight you want to research, watch the fight, make your notes, do whatever you got to do. And then we have direct links to their topology page, Instagram page, uh, UFC stats page, MMA decisions page, everything on one page for you to make it super easy to do all your researching in an effective amount of time. Check it out with a seven day free trial. Find out why some of the top coaches, fighters, analysts, handicappers, and gamblers utilize this service to ensure they're getting the best bang for their buck and making sure they can do the best researching possible uh, when they're studying for these upcoming cards. So again, seven day free trial available. Check the link in the description below. All right, we got UFC Vegas 90 headed our way this weekend, and it is a rematch in the main event in the middleweight division as we have Brendan Allen looking to avenge his last loss while snatching his seventh straight victory as he takes on Chris Curtis, who's looking to build upon his last victory over Marc-Andre Barrio, who he was able to defeat back in January. Now, uh, Brendan Allen was originally scheduled to fight former title challenger Marvin Vittori, but Vittori was forced to pull out and Brendan Allen more than wanted to accept this rematch against Curtis so he can get that fight back. One that he found himself as a minus 350 favorite in in the first meeting. This weekend he finds himself closer to minus 200. The public thinking that I can still probably get it done again. What do I think? You can find out later on in this podcast when I get around to breaking down that fight for you guys. All right. Before we get into the breakdowns, always a couple of things I'd like to check off the checklist here. The first of which is the recap of this past weekend's uh results. We went 4-0 on lock of the night plays through the UFC and uh the three regional shows that I covered. We went three and one on our I believe it was three and one on our dog of the night plays as well. So I'm very happy about that. Um and the UFC was the only losing event that we had. So I'll quickly talk about that now. We had minus about a unit and a half there. But luckily, uh, with the help of the regional shows, we were up eight and a half units on the weekend. Once again, a lot of that having to do with the regional performance that we had. But mostly, you guys care about the UFC event. So let's talk about that first and foremost. So uh, the lock of the night play for the UFC uh, Atlantic City card was Jacob Alcoon at minus two. What did I get here? Minus two ten. He comes through for us. Uh, I believe all three judges had the first round for Petrovsky, but I expected the first round to be competitive, and Malkun was going to start to take over in the second round, and I felt he was coming on a little strong, and then eventually that weird finish happened where Petrovsky shot into the hip of Malkun and split open his head, caused his equilibrium to uh, get off balance, and it was just a weird finish, a finish we've never seen in the past before, but I'm very happy that it ended up going that way because you got to take those bumps. You got to take those bounces every now and then those weird bounces whether it's a split decision or a wacky finish like this um i'll be happy to catch that ticket any day of the week uh but i'm happy that malkun was able to go out there and catch that for us that's three straight lock of the night plays now for ufc events we got to keep that run rolling so he catches for plus 2.38 units the dog of the night the only underdog i actually predicted to win on the card ended up coming through for us with manofiro going out there and uh, clean sweeping Aaron Blanchfield on the scorecards, uh, stuff in the takedowns, uh, jabbing her up from distance utilizing a lot of lateral movement pretty much exactly how i broke down that fight if you guys want to go back and listen to that breakdown that i had i feel like i broke it down to a t there uh you know i will say that i think that we i was expecting a little bit of more takedown attempts from blanchfield but i think she was really having troubles closing that distance and getting effective takedown attempts considering the strength that she felt from Firo, who was clearly way stronger in that spot um and then the inability to 
to really track her down because of the continuous movement and that jab that was coming down the pipe. So great work from Firo to cash at plus 165 for us as the underdog. Now let's go down the rest of the uh, the, the bets here that I have tracked on the screen for you guys. Vicente Luque, minus 1.15 units there. Very weird performance from him. You know, you can say what you want about Buckley uh, and his knockout power, sure. But like to see Luque pull guard like that and then just willingly accept getting bombed on, like he had his knee shield up, like he had his guard and it seemed like he could have pushed off on Buckley whenever he wanted, but he just willingly ate those shots. It was a very weird situation. I don't know if he was hurt from something earlier on in the fight that just uh, stayed with him going into that second round. But one of the weirdest and most un like performances we've ever seen. But still, got to take it on the chin. You know what I mean? Just like the Petrovsky thing that happened, it is what it is. It's the game of MMA, and we have to take the L on Vicente Luque there. The uh, next play here, this is the one that I think I regret the most in terms of the unit sizing. I felt very confident in Lupita Godinez here, and I felt I was a little bit too dismissive of the threats that Jandy Roba presented in this matchup. I largely believed in Godinez's ability to keep this fight upright with the wrestling advantage I expected her to have, but there were some weird tangled moments and especially with Jandy Roba's ability to establish her jab from distance, it caused Godinez a lot of issues, more issue, more issues than I really expected it to. So um, I shouldn't have written off Jandy Roba the way that I did. At most, I probably should have only gone two units on Godinez there, a minus 200 to win a unit that probably would have put us just in the black uh, on the event. But um, I felt pretty good about her and, and clearly my read was off so I gotta take that one on the chin as well so minus four units on her there uh, we do cash a unit on Dennis Bazuki at minus 125 as he goes out there and completely squashes Connor Matthews right there wasn't really a point in that fight that Matthews really seemed like he was in the fight uh, Bazuki getting the finish great work from him overall um, you know I don't think he goes far in the UFC but that was a very winnable matchup for him I was surprised to see the line kind of move against us as well come fight time bringing Bazookia down to minus 115 but still minus 125 was still a good enough number for me to take the shot and I'm glad that we were able to cash it there and then our chalky parlay of the night ends up blowing up in our face uh Bill Algio as well Colin Lorrain goes out there and squashes Angel Pacheco the way that we expected him so that like cashes with relative ease but then the uh, Bill Algio and Cal Nelson fight very surprising to me like I know Kyle Nelson has knockout power but we've seen Bill Algio go out there against heavier punchers and be completely fine but for some reason something that Kyle Nelson was able to do was really able to rattle uh, Bill Algio and uh, cause him to be unable to fight back into a matchup where he ended up getting hurt so uh, I knew that the early threat from Nelson was there but I expected the unorthodox movement and style of Algio to prevail for him at that point that was not the case Kyle Nelson did a great job in terms of hurting him and then swarming him and eventually getting him out of there um, I wish we would have seen that fight go on a little bit longer you know what I mean I don't mind standing TKOs but I feel like Algio is a guy that possibly could have battled back into that matchup but regardless Kyle Nelson makes the most of his opportunity and goes out there and finishes Algio. So we have to rip up a, a one and a half unit uh, parlay uh, with Algio and Lorraine. And that ultimately leaves us with minus 1.62 units on the on the UFC night. Again, the regionals really helped us last weekend as we we're up pretty big. Lock of the night's hitting all across the board. Uh, and then again, officially tracked uh, eight and a half units up on the weekend even with the small l that we had here on the ufc so uh the lock of the night play now improves to 22 and 12 on the year for 65 percent uh hit rate again up about five percent showing how early we are still in the year that you know a four and all weekend can drastically improve our uh accuracy rate and then the dog of the night comes through again three and one on the weekend which now improves our record to 14 and 20 and that jumped up about four to five percent as well to 41 percent hit rate very happy with my performances in regards to those things the only thing I really regret for the weekend is the overconfidence in the Lupita Godina side. All right, uh, reminder, the Lockheed Two-Step and Lockheed Trinity drops earlier in the week compared to the Friday drop that I have for the public now. So if you guys want access to that, you guys can find that on the Lock of the Night Patreon page. Link for that is in the description below. A little bit later uh, of a drop this week than usual. Uh, really couldn't get into the groove of studying. And if I'm not in the groove of studying, if I can't get in the mindset of studying, I'm not going to force myself to study because that will cause some, you know, 
uh, misplays, some uh, maybe not seeing something clearly, and that might cause me to have a poor prediction or a poor analysis of a fight. So I apologize for the uh, delay in the dropping of the podcast. I'm currently recording this on Tuesday night. Usually I like to get the podcasts out on Monday, but I should be able to get back on track next week. Uh, just a slight adjustment in terms of the content that's dropping this week. Um, it's obviously Tuesday night now, the MMA lock has drops. Wednesday is going to be the lock of the night, top three lock of the night candidates, top three dog of the night candidate videos. Both of those will drop on Wednesday, uh, as well as the PFL full card breakdown should drop Wednesday evening as the card actually goes down on Thursday. So keep your eyes peeled for that in terms of breakdowns for PFL. I know a lot of you guys really seek those out, and I'm very happy to provide those breakdowns for you guys uh, anytime they do an event. They got three straight weekends of events coming up. I have you guys covered every Tuesday slash Wednesday depending on uh, my uh, my efficiency I guess if you want to call it that uh, also there are going to be two other events going down this weekend uh, that I'll be covering sorry three other events LFA KSW and Cage Warriors all of those will be broken down strictly on the lock of the night Patreon page so if you want access to those again we killed it this past weekend let's see if we can keep it rolling again and uh, stack on top of UFC and PFL so if you want access to those Lock of the Night Patreon page, link in the description below. Check that out. And then lastly, shout out to Godzilla Wins, providing your boy a platform to drop written breakdowns for you guys. On Thursdays, we drop the main event breakdown on the website. And then on Fridays, we drop the three best money line spots that you guys can get a hold of. Uh, again, GodzillaWins.com. Not just for the UFC, which I pretty much run over there, but all other team sports, all of the sports that you can possibly bet on. Make sure you guys check out the fine fellows over there. GodzillaWins.com. All right, we got 12 fights to break down. We did have one fall off earlier this week uh, with uh, Victor Hugo and Alatang Haley. Alatang Haley pulls out. Hugo still looking for a, um, a short notice replacement. So maybe later this week, if they do end up finding a replacement for him, once the odds drop, once I'm able to study that matchup, I'll drop another break, or a video for you guys strictly breaking down that matchup. So don't worry about you about about that. I'll have you guys covered in that aspect. But we got 12 fights to break down for this uh, as as of right now for this UFC Vegas 90 card so without further ado let's get right into it first fa fight up is going to be in the women's bantamweight division as we have Nora Cornol Cornole butchering that name I know she's French <laughs> she comes in at plus 285 she's going up against Melissa Tanya Mullins who comes in at minus 350 uh Cornole uh, made her UFC debut back at UFC Paris in September where she was able to pick up a decision victory over Jocelyn Edwards in a fight that all three rounds were pretty close uh, but it was Cornell that seemed to be landing the more effective damage which ultimately had the judges scored in her favor. Edwards was landing takedowns with relative ease and I believe that's a big hole in Cornell's game that she's going to have to figure out especially as she continues to work through the UFC bantamweight division she's a fighter that's very aggressive uh, lacks a lot of technique in my opinion she does her best work when she's able to get her opponents to the ground and utilize her physical advantages that she has more often than not but otherwise you know she has a lot of holes in her game that I feel like opponents are going to be able to take advantage of and that's exactly what we have this weekend with Melissa Mullins who I believe is a better fighter now Cornell may be able to dish out a little bit more damage in the striking realm but Mullins is steadily improving in that realm but it's really her ground game that where Cornell is going to find problems Mullins is so good in terms of landing takedowns and asserting that top dominant control the best thing about her grappling game is the fact that she knows how to distribute her weight and how to move her hips whenever there's any scrambling opportunities whether she's moving from you know half guard to side control or even the from back to full mass like I love her transitions there because even if it looks like she's about to lose position she does a great job in terms of shifting her weight so that she's able to re-establish that dominant position and then get back to just throwing elbows and big heat from that top position she in my opinion is one of the brighter, brighter prospects in this women's bantamweight division and I think with more experience and more grooming she should be able to eventually crack into that title shot contention um, you know with a little bit more fights uh, going, again going from fighting a girl like her to you know the top five of the division that's a big leap so let's let her take her time uh she's 32 years old so she's definitely gonna have to get working but i think that she will stay busy enough here uh that she can slowly work up that ladder while gaining the experience required to potentially fight for a title one day but i love her grappling she's so dominant from that top position and she does
does a great job in throwing elbows from that top spot too. So for this matchup particularly, I think her previous matchup against Arena Alexiva would be a difficult, more difficult matchup than this Cornell one. I think Cornell is not that good. You know, I think that uh, seeing how Edwards was able to get her to the ground with relative ease, and even though Cornell was able to pull off some reversals in that spot, that was more so on Edwards uh, in terms of not being able to maintain those spots. She was too high when she was on her back. She did not have the dominant control to be able to keep Cornell in those decisions, which is or those positions, which allowed Cornell to just you know reverse out of those spots very easily. She's not going to have that ease here against Mullins, who, who will be able to control those positions a lot better. And I think she possibly even finds a spot where she's able to posture up and rain down a TKO here. So Cornell, in my opinion, worth the chalk. Again, not a lot of people like playing chalk in women's MMA fights, but I feel there's a big enough discrepancy here, especially in the grappling room, that will allow Mullins to dominate this fight and make it look easy. Maybe a little bit close early, but probably in the second or third round, uh, I expect we'll see Mullins assert that dominant top position and eventually find a TKO or a submission. Give me Mullins and Mullins inside the distance. Next up, a middleweight matchup between Dylan Budka, who comes in at minus 140, going up against Cesar Almeida, who comes in at plus 120. Now, both these fighters are coming off the contender series. We'll talk about Budka first, who took his fight on less than a week and a half notice uh, when he was able to defeat Chad Hanacombe in a fight that was very slow, very boring and very grindy and it seemed like Dana just gave uh, Budka a contract here because he really respected the fact that he came in on super short notice and was still able to get the win. Dylan Budka is a very strong and physically imposing fighter that normally likes to utilize his big power to close a distance but you do utilize his grinding grappling ability to keep his opponents in uncomfortable positions against the cage or on the ground where he's able to just grind them and drag most of his fights out to a decision and win it on the scorecards. Uh, I think he lacks a little bit of technique in, in some of his spots, but he's been able to make up for, for the physicality that he brings to the table, which is why he's been so successful on the regional scene. On the opposite side here, we have kickboxing extraordinaire Cesar Almeida, who utilized a lot of grappling in his last matchup against, in my opinion, a more complete fighter in Lucas Fernando, but he did a great job in terms of shutting down whatever Fernando was throwing at him. Obviously, Fernando was able to rally back a little bit in that third round, but it was too little too late as Almeida had done enough damage to the first two rounds to easily win that fight on the scorecards. But Almeida is, you know, a kickboxer at heart. He had over 40... Uh, wins on the kickboxing regional scene out of I believe 47 or 48 total fights uh, he shared the K or the ring with Alex Pereira a couple times even has a win over him uh, in the kickboxing world uh, but it seems like he's improving his grappling game which will be very important for him especially as he gets into the UFC's middleweight division now he's 36 years old so things might be you know uh, a little quick for him if he wants to get closer to title contention but I just don't think that's something that's in his future I think this is a guy that can be very competitive with some of the unranked middleweights in the UFC, especially if he's able to keep fights in the striking realm where he'll more often than not have an advantage. Now, in this matchup against Dylan Budka, I expect Almeida to have to deal with some grappling and some grinding from Budka, but considering the improvements that we saw from Almeida in his last fight, which I think might be a more challenging fight than this one will end up being, I think we'll see him be able to nullify the clinching and the grappling of Budka and damage him in those close positions where he's able to land some some clinch knees and elbows eventually get back out into space and start utilizing his one twos and his combination striking to really light up Budka. This is a spot that if he is able to get enough time out in space he could potentially knock out Dylan Budka but I really expect that uh, Budka will be uh, impl implementing a lot of clinching which will cause this fight to go into deeper waters but I ultimately think it will be the damage that will be on the Almeida side that allows him to go out there and get this fight uh handed to him uh, by decision. So I'm going to go Almeida, uh, solid underdog spot in my opinion. I think he's technically the better matchup here. It all just comes down to if he can shut down the physicality of Budka, which will be really challenging early, but hopefully it gets a little bit easier as this fight goes into deeper waters. So give me Almeida and Almeida by decision. Next up, we got Bantamweights throwing down here as we have Dan Argueta coming in at plus 145. He takes on Gene Matsumoto, who comes in at minus 170. Now, we'll start off on the Argueta side, who let me down 
heavily last time around as he came up short against Miles Johns in a spot where I had him as a lock of the night play. I felt very confident in Argoeta that night as I expected his pace, pressure, and wrestling advantage to be the difference maker against Johns, but Johns shut that shit down and absolutely butchered him on the feet or at least landed way more damaging blows on the feet to end up getting that uh, victory by decision. I was very surprised that Argoeta was unable to get much success off in that matchup as I really believed he had way more advantages in that fight against Johns. But Johns showcased solid fight IQ improvements and an overall improvement in his game, especially since he's joined up with the guys over there at Marathon MMA. And uh, that really shut down the game that Argoeta was trying to implement. Argueta is a wrestle-heavy fighter that likes to take his opponents to the ground and grind them out, although I do have questions about his abilities to control opponents in those spots, but he has a good enough gas tank to do it for 15 minutes if he has to, and if his opponent's takedown defense game is not the greatest. Now, he his only win right now in the UFC is over Nick Aguedi, who he was able to pretty much do what he wanted to, considering that Aguirre didn't really have much of an answer for the wrestling that was coming his way, but Aguirre also wanted to attack a lot with his jiu-jitsu off of his back, allowing Argueta to pretty much dictate the pace of that fight. His opponent this week in his 24-year-old 14-0 Gene Matsumoto, who very much jumped on my radar during his LFA stint and showcased to me that this is a very bright prospect with a great all-around game. He comes from a Muay Thai camp, but has a BJJ brown belt and has showcased that his defensive grappling has improved enough that he could be competitive against some of the best fighters in the UFC's bantamweight division. His bread and butter is definitely striking as we saw in his contender series matchup where he ended up earning his UFC contract by defeating Casey Tanner and he was able to stuff the majority of takedowns that were coming his way and even when he did get taken down he did a great job in terms of getting his feet on the hips of his opponent pushing him off and getting back to his feet and eventually getting back to his combination striking game he loves to attack the lead leg of his opponents with his own kicks but I love the fact that he stays consistent with his output and his volume especially throwing in combinations and more than one strike whenever he lets his strikes go i love everything about this kid and as he, as he continues to improve his defensive grappling game he should be able to dictate where fights take place and more often than not he will have the advantage in the striking realm and i expect that to be the difference maker against dan argueta this weekend now i'm seeing some love on the argueta side as people expect uh the the experience advantage that argueta has in the ufc and the wrestling advantage that you have should be able to enough to trump a dana white contender series striker but i think people are kind of uh dismissing uh the defensive grappling skills of matsumoto i do think that he will do enough in terms of if he does get taken down he should be able to work back to his feet pretty effectively and then the damage he's going to be able to dish out here with the significant striking advantage he has over argueta should be able to nullify any of the control time that argueta was able to put together this is obviously a very stiff test for matsumoto so i can understand some people's hesitancy in terms of taking the minus 170 chalk on him but this is another matchup where it kind of reminds me of Casey Tanner and the the uh, with the the line movement. This is a fight where well in that Casey Tanner fight, I took Gene Matsumoto at minus one forty five, uh, and had seen him previously at minus one sixty five. So I was happy to get one forty five. And then come fight time, it turns out that he the line swung so much that he ended up coming in as an underdog at plus one ten. And we saw how easily he was able to control that fight and pretty much beat Casey Tanner throughout those fifteen minutes. The second round a little bit close, but I really thought Matsumoto did enough to win that fight, no matter what. In this matchup, I could definitely see some late week action coming in on Argueta that could potentially get us a better line on Matsumoto. So I'm going to wait probably until Friday to pull the trigger on Matsumoto here. But I do think he's the better fighter overall. Uh, I think his advantages in the striking realm, especially with his ability to land damage, will allow him to go out there and either... Um, you know what? I think Argueta is tough enough to see the scorecards here. So I'm going to take Matsumoto to win by decision. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, people are overlooking the true skill set and potential of Matsumoto here. And uh, again, I'm not trying to swing too far on the pendulum on Argueta as this guy's, you know, he's talented. His wrestling is very difficult to deal with. But I think Matsumoto does a solid job in terms of dictating the range, seeing takedown attempts coming from far out. And I know he's going to be expecting a ton of them here from Argueta. So I'm sure he'll be doing a good job in terms of chopping the lead leg, keeping the distance, uh, and doing his best to just sprawl on those takedowns. But even if he does get taken down, I've seen enough from his defensive grappling skills to realize that he should be able to, 
you know, nullify the amount of control time Argueta will get, and then from there be able to damage him from that uh, striking realm and win this fight on the scorecards strictly based off of damage. So give me Matsumoto and Matsumoto by decision. Next up, we got a strawweight matchup between Piera Rodriguez, who comes in at minus 145. She takes on Cynthia Calvillo, who comes in at plus 125. Now, Rodriguez came up short against Jillian, Rodriguez, or Jillian Robertson last time around, and that was the first fight that she had suffered a professional loss in. And that was a fight where she had some decent success in the early going with her striking. But once Robertson really started to go for the takedowns, Piera Rodriguez had no answer for it. On the regional scene, I've seen Rodriguez get taken down, but effectively work back to her feet, shutting down most of her opponent's success in the grappling realm. But she's unable to do it against Jillian Robertson, who we know is very tough to deal with when she does get her opponents to the mat. Rodriguez is a solid striker, and when she's able to really get comfortable and in her groove in that striking realm, it's very difficult to deal with her, especially with the power and sting that she normally lands with. She's not a big finisher, especially over the last couple fights that she's won, but she does enough damage to usually cause the referees or, or judges to score fights in her favor. Her uh, next matchup here uh, is going up against Cynthia Cavio, who clearly is not having a good time, as you can see through all the red that we have on the screen here, if you guys are watching on the YouTubes. Uh, but she's on a five-fight losing streak, which is a far cry from what she had coming into the COVID era. She was, I believe, 8-1 and one coming into the COVID era, and her first fight was a main event slot against former title challenger Jessica I. She was able to defeat her over five rounds and win that fight on the scorecard, but that was the last of the success that we would see Calvio have inside the octagon. Since then, she's lost to Caitlin Sermonara, Jessica Andrade, Andrea Lee, uh, Nina Nunes, and then most recently to Lupita Godinez. Although in that Godinez fight, it seemed like momentum was starting to shift Calvillo's way. Unfortunately for her, she didn't do enough in the first two rounds to get her hand raised as the fight went to a scorecard, and we saw Godinez get the split decision victory there. But Calvillo, at her best, is a fighter who is able to take opponents to the ground and grind them out from that top position, even opening up some mission opportunities that she is able to snatch onto. This is a fighter that started off her career mainly with the Team Alpha Male guys, but has recently moved over to Syndicate MMA where she shares mats with her significant other, Mitch Ramirez, who just recently signed to the UFC as well. But she's a fighter that if she can get back to the style of getting opponents to the ground and really implementing that grapple-heavy approach she was successful with earlier in her career, this is a fighter that could still have success. You know, she's 36 years old, but the level of opponent uh, is very important that she's going up against. And I think it's in her favor this weekend. She has an experience advantage over a Pierre Rodriguez against much tougher competition. And we know if Calvillo is able to get takedown, something that Rodriguez seems to be having issues with, Cynthia should be able to grind her out in this spot. Calvillo will have a size and strength advantage in this matchup as she was formerly a flyweight coming down to strawweight now once again. I think that's the difference that we saw in the Robertson fight as well for Rodriguez as Robertson had the strength advantage and I think that allowed her to really keep Rodriguez on the mat and that's what should help Calvillo in this spot as well. So to take a veteran like Calvillo and I get it, it does not look good with the run that she is on but seeing the life that she had in her in the Lupita Godinez fight still shows me that she has the chops to go out there and be successful and this is a stylistic clash that i expect her to be successful in so give me calvio here and i think she could even find the submission you can get the submission prop right now at plus 700 at the time of this recording i think it's worth a little bit of a shot especially if calvio is able to secure as much grinding grappling success as i expect her to have so give me calvio calvio by submission and i think she's a damn good underdog play for this weekend all right, sticking with the women's, but moving up a few divisions, we're, go we're going to talk about a women's bantamweight matchup here between Norma Dumont, who comes in at minus two six or minus 160, and her opponent, the returning and new mom, Jermaine Durandamy, who comes in at plus 140. We'll start off on the Norma Dumont side, who seems to be in her groove right now and is looking for a four-fight winning streak if she's able to get her hand raised this weekend. Last time around, we saw her absolutely bully and butcher Chelsea Chandler, 
over 15 minutes, winning that fight relatively easily on the scorecards. That was a fight where she had the striking advantage and clearly the grappling advantage, and Chandler had no answer for anything Dumont was throwing at her. Dumont has some slick boxing and is very difficult to deal with when she gets physical in the clinch and the grappling realm, but I do think she still lacks some technical things in the grappling realm uh, that will cause her issues against the top of the division, just as we saw when she fought Macy Kiasson. But Dumont is still very dangerous. Like her, like I said, her hands and her output is something to keep an eye on, and that could allow her to be successful in this matchup. But Tremaine Durandamy is a former UFC featherweight champion, and I know she's been out of the cage for three and a half years. She just gave birth in March of 2023, so it's interesting to see her come back about a year after that. But at her best, she's a very difficult striker to deal with. If this was an active Jermaine Durandamy and not coming off of a you know a pregnancy and a layoff, I wouldn't even think twice about taking a shot at her uh, at plus one forty against a fighter like Dumont. You know, I do think that Durandamy uh, she'll have the size and uh, height or sorry height and reach advantage in this matchup. And we've seen steady improvements from her in her grappling uh, game. That I think she should be able to keep this fight upright. And if she comes in in the right shape, in the right mind frame, she might be able to really touch up Dumont from distance and cause her issues in the striking realm. I think that we'll see Durandamy keep this fight up, and I think that we'll see her land her strikes from distance and really cause Dumont a lot of issues. Again, the only issue in terms of why I won't get to the betting window with Durandamy is the layoff and the pregnancy. As a fighter, I think she's way more skilled overall than Norma Dumont here, and she should be able to have her advantages in the striking realm and take full advantage of that as well. So give me Durandamy and Durandamy by decision. Um, not a bad underdog shot, but be wary about all the things that I just laid out for you guys. All right, moving on to the next fight here. Well to weights, we got the aging veteran Court McGee. Coming in at plus 245, going up against the always entertaining Alex Morono, who comes in at minus 290. Now, I had some confidence in Court McGee last time around, as I thought he would be able to grind on a fellow veteran, old-timer, Matt Brown, and he had some decent success through the first couple minutes of their matchup. Then he ate a massive right hand, I believe it was right hand, from Matt Brown in the last minute of the first round, and it seemed like McGee wanted none of that after that. Like, he wasn't even knocked out cold, he was just hurt so badly by that punch that he didn't even react after getting, like, he dropped and then didn't even try defending a possible next shot that would come from Matt Brown. Thankfully, the referee stepped in and called the fight off, so uh, McGee didn't have to eat an unanswered shot like that. But what was once a positive for McGee, his durability, is now the down, downfall of his career at this point of his uh, at this point of his career. Uh, he's off two straight losses now, both by knockout. The Jeremiah Wilds one we can give him a pass for, considering how big of a puncher Jeremiah Wilds actually is. But then the Matt Brown fight, that one was like, okay, maybe his chin is actually gone. You know, at his best, McGee is a guy that can put a grappling, grinding, heavy pace, high pressure type of fight uh, onto his opponents and grind them out over 15 minutes to get his hand raised, like he did against Claudio Silva and Ramiz Bragimaj, which was his last two wins. But then he's going up against a guy in Alex Morono here, who kind of likes to do the same thing, but is six years younger than him. So with Morono last time around, he came up short against Joaquin Buckley, who was able to 30-27 him across all uh, three scorecards. And that was mainly due to the physicality, explosive or explosivity and power advantage that Buckley held over Morono. Morono is a lunch pill type of fighter, right? This guy's a BJJ black belt, but doesn't often look to take fights to the ground because he struggles to really um, get fights to the ground to begin with. But he just loves wars. He loves to walk forward. He loves to throw in combinations. He loves to throw volume. And he has deceiving power at times, which usually cause opponents to break. His win over Matt Semmelsberger, a lot of people were questioning him going into that matchup, considering that Semmelsberger had the physicality advantage, but he was unable to deal with the pace and pressure that Morono was putting on him, ultimately allowing Morono to hurt him on numerous occasions, and then eventually win that fight on the scorecards. Morono's a tough out. He is very tough to deal with. If you do not have a tremendous physicality advantage over him, and good enough technique to take advantage of it you're in for a tough fight and I think that's the case here with Port McGee you know Morono should have good enough defensive grappling here and I wouldn't even be surprised if he's able to latch onto a guillotine as we saw he was able to do against Tim Means 
but I think that he'll be able to defend well enough in the clinch and in the grappling to eventually get back to a striking game where he should be able to break uh, McGee here and possibly even find a knockout. I think the cheeky spot here wouldn't be uh, would be a, a submission stab on uh, Morona in case he goes for a club and sub. I believe the the KO line is you know not as um, juicy as the submission line so maybe that's a way people can take advantage of it but i wouldn't even mind morono as a straight up parlay piece i think he knocks out or clubs and subs mcgee at some point in this matchup early going should be a little bit grindy a little bit close but as this fight starts to wear on as and as morono starts to land more and more damage on mcgee look for mcgee to possibly look for a way out in this matchup i think mcgee is just fighting his contract out at this point in time uh and he just wants to collect a paycheck or two and i think we'll see morono help him find the door uh around the second or third round of this matchup all right possibly what is fight of the night is what we have next up. Lightweight matchup here between Trevor Peak, who comes in at plus 165. He's going up against Charlie Campbell, who comes in at minus 190. Now, we'll start off on the Trevor Peak side, who I've largely not really been that high on throughout his career. Now, you know, I picked against him on the contender series. Um, I don't think I picked against him uh, in the Eric Gonzalez fight. I picked against him with Chepe Mariscal and was able to cash that ticket. It was a hellacious and big sweat of a fight. But thankfully, we got the plus money there on Mariscal. And then I picked Trevor Peak against Mohamed Yaya last time around as I really don't think Yaya is that good. But I've largely shit on Peak's technical abilities, right? But the guy's willingness to fight... Uh, his ironclad chin, his ability to move forward and just put pressure on his opponents usually makes up for the technical uh, deficiencies in his game. And I think he's starting to come become more and more comfortable at the UFC level that it might not have mattered that he has these technical disadvantages when he steps inside the cage. He throws with such power. He continues to come forward. He doesn't accept bad positions. Like if he gets taken down, he does a great job in terms of just working back to his feet or getting a reversal going of some sort. Uh, he has started to implement grappling in his own right. Um, it's it's impressive to see some of the improvements that we've seen from him over his last couple of fights. Uh, but he's going up against a technically better fighter here in Charlie Campbell. Campbell is a guy that utilizes great combination striking, likes to utilize the range, really chip away at his opponents with his 72-inch reach that he normally brings to the table, um, trains out of the Sarah Longo crew, uh, solid fighter all around, right? Um, it seems like he learned a lot from his Chris Duncan loss, which was the contender series interview that he had, and that was a fight where he was pretty much winning a minute in 10 seconds of it until Chris Duncan was able to land a very nasty counter uh, when Charlie Campbell was trying to get Duncan out of there and it put uh, Campbell's lights out cold uh, but he learned a lot from that fight because in his next two fights he's not really chasing the knockouts he still won by knockout in both of those fights against Strauss Streaker and Alex Reyes which was his UFC debut but he let the knockouts come to him he had Reyes hurt on numerous occasions in that fight but didn't chase the finish let it eventually come to him, and then that's how he was able to go out there and get his hand raised. If he continues to show that type of um, patience and poise and you know veteran IQ, he will be successful at this at this level. Now, that's going to be difficult to do against a guy in Trevor Peak who's going to always try to get a war going, try to engage in war, try to cause uh, Campbell to exchange with him in the pocket. But I think that we'll see Campbell do a good enough job in terms of establishing his range and just pot shotting peak and trying to keep him at distance i wouldn't even be surprised if you see campbell try to take this fight to the ground and establish some grappling dominance but i don't think he's uh significantly better than peak in the grappling realm which will cause peak issues uh or um which would allow peak to actually work back to his feet and um you know get back to what he does best walking forward throwing bombs so I am going to lean with Campbell in this matchup. I think he's the technically better and slicker fighter here. My, you know, my concern comes if Peak is able to successfully crash that pocket, land a big shot on Campbell and put his lights out cold. But I think that we'll see that steady work from Campbell here. And what has me intrigued is the fight to start round two. Now that's a little bit of an unorthodox prop compared to what you guys are normally hearing from me. But I feel like I believe the over one and a half is that plus money, which leads me to believe the fight starts around two might be roughly around even or a slight plus money. But I think that this is a fight where Campbell will keep that distance, utilize his jab from distance, knowing that Peak has an ironclad chin. I think it'll be difficult for Campbell to get him out of there early. So I'm thinking that we get some minutes under our belt here. Let's get to the second round. Maybe even take a little bit of a shot at the over one and a half too. But I do think that we'll see Campbell 
uh, touch up peak for the majority of this matchup. I don't know if he finishes him. I think this is a spot where we can get a cheeky bet on Campbell to win by decision. Um, yeah, I'm going to go with Campbell. Fight starts round two will probably be the only action I have on this matchup. But I do like Campbell to get his hand raised uh, by landing better damage throughout this matchup. So give me Campbell. And I guess Campbell by decision. All right. Next up, heavyweights going at it here as we have the UFC debut of Johnny Walker's brother, Walter Walker. He comes in at minus 270, chalky line there. He goes up against Lucas Dresky, who comes in at plus 230, who's looking to save his UFC career as he's currently riding a three-fight losing streak. Now, let's start off on the Walter Walker side, who I honestly did not expect to be impressed by when I ran his tape, but I was this guy looks a little bit more complete than Johnny Walker. Like, he may not have the crazy explosivity and crazy knockout power that Walker uh, Johnny brings to the table, but he has a solid all-around complete game. He can strike, and he has an underrated wrestling game where he's able to take opponents to the ground and smash them from that opposition or grind them out over 15 minutes to win uh, decisions. But he does a great job in terms of establishing that top position and slowly working his way to better and more dominant spots so he can posture up and get a TKO. He trains out of uh, Gore MMA, which is mainly known for another UFC fighter, Bogdan Guskov. And these guys are pretty much in each other's corners at all times. And uh, they train together, which is great considering they're both big bodies. Uh, Walter, 6'6", 81 inch reach, huge guy, just like his brother, but fighting at heavyweight. Might even be better than his brother. <laughs> but what time will tell as he continues to work to the UFC heavyweight division. His uh, opponent this week in Lucas Dresky has been through the ringer over his last couple of fights. He lost a decision to Martin Budai. Very close fight. Possibly one that a lot of people thought that Dresky could have got his hand raised in. But he was dealing with a high pressure, high output fighter in uh, Martin Budai. His next fight, he gets completely grinded out by Carl Williams. Who was able to take him to the ground and just wear on him over 15 minutes and, you know... Not allowing Dresky to have any success in that fight, honestly. Uh, and then the Waldo Cortez Acosta fight last time around that uh, Dresky got knocked out in about three minutes into that matchup. Dresky at his best is a guy that normally establishes his range with the striking, throwing in combinations, and really touching up opponents from distance. But he's been unable to do so because he's had some very tough and unfortunate stylistic matchups. His best matchup to get a win was the Martin Budai fight, but it didn't work out for him as he was always on the back foot and it seemed to the judges, that he was the one eating heavier shots, even though he ended up landing more than Budai that night. Now, in this matchup against Walker, I think he's going to struggle once again. Walker has good enough striking to stay competitive in that realm, but I think he's more explosive, and he's faster to the punch, which will cause Dresky some issues, just like it did in the Waldo Cortez Acosta fight. But I ultimately think it's going to be the grappling of Walker that is the downfall of Dresky, as he's going to struggle to keep up with the much bigger and stronger Walker, especially when the fight hits the mat. And I think that we'll see Walker... Um, work to get to these dominant positions and he might not be able to posture up and get a finish but I think he can grind this fight out over 15 minutes keep, keeping Dresky in those bad spots and landing more damage and then eventually winning this fight on the scorecards it's a tough time to be Lucas Dresky especially to welcome a undefeated heavyweight prospect like Walter Vol Walker who's still only 26 years old very unfortunate but I'm going to go with Walker here. I think he grinds this fight out over 15 minutes and gets his hand raised mainly with a grapple-heavy style on the scorecards. All right, moving over to the lightweight division. We got Ignacio Baja Mundes coming in at minus 330. He goes up against Christos Yagos, who comes in at plus 270. We'll start off on the Ignacio side, who's coming off a loss to Ludovic Klein, a very surprising loss, I will say. And I will say the first round... I, I, if Klein was to have success in that fight, that was going to be how he had it, by hurting Ignacio, dropping him, and then getting some control time. But as this fight was getting into deeper waters, I expected Bahamunas to do enough damage in the striking round, and his takedown defense and get-ups holding up enough for him to still win that fight in the second and third rounds. He won the second round, I believe, on two judges' scorecards, but was unable to do much in the third round as Klein completely muzzled him, taking him to the ground and grinding him out from that top position. I was very surprised that Bahamundes was unable to get up from that spot. Um, but I still have some confidence and hope that Bahamundes will continue to improve, especially considering that he's only 26 years old. He's a guy that can go out there and really put 
uh, and on his opponents with his striking. I think the best performance we've seen from him to date is the one that he had against uh, Roosevelt Roberts, where he absolutely torched him on the feet for about 14 minutes until he landed a beautiful spinning back kick to knock out Roberts in the last round. Um, very solid fighter, you know, training with the, the Bilal Mohammeds and uh, the Charles Radkeys of the world up there in Chicago. Uh, nasty Muay Thai, nasty kickboxing. We know what he brings to the table with his striking. If he continues to improve his grappling, especially his get-ups, this guy's going to be a very difficult fighter for opponents to try to be victorious in. His opponent this weekend, Crystal Siagos, uh, is coming off of a loss to Daniel Zauhuber, where he got submitted in the second round of their matchup. But it's the Ricky Glenn fight that I want to hone in on, because prior to that matchup, Yagos was largely relying on his grapple-heavy approaches to try to defeat his opponents. But if he's unable to get them out of there early, he normally suffers from a cardio dump, allowing his opponents to take over and eventually finish him in the second or third rounds of their matchup. But in the Ricky Glenn fight, was the one where he said he wanted to start trusting his hands a little bit more, and it ended up paying off for him as he was able to knock out Glenn a minute and a half into their matchup. He tried doing the same thing against Daniel Zhao Huber, and he did hurt Zhao Huber, causing judges to score that first round in his favor, but then we saw him go to his wrestling in the second round. It did not work out for him. Zhao Huber was able to stop it. He was able to chip away at him, and that caused a desperation takedown attempt from Zhao Huber, or from Yagos that allowed Zhao Huber to wrap up a submission and get the tap out from Yagos in that spot. That's always going to be the issue in Yagos' game. If he can't get opponents out of there early, either with his grappling dominance, uh, getting a ground and pound submission, or even just that big knockout power like he showed against Ricky Glenn, he's going to get chipped away at, and he's going to end up losing or getting finished. And that's where I expect uh, to see here against Bajo Mundes. I get why Bajo Mundes is chalky here, but there is that potential early finishing power of Yagos that could throw a wrench in anybody's plans if they're looking to go out there and parlay Bajo Mundes. However, I think I got the perfect remedy there. Yago's round one knockout is plus 1,700 right now on Bet Online. That's not a bad hedge opportunity if you're looking to parlay Bajo Mundes, who should be able to win this fight relatively easily. But in any MMA matchup, we see that knockouts could uh, you know, stifle anybody's plan. It's possible, especially early in fights, and especially with how much heat that Yago's throws. So he might be able to land on Bajo Mundes and put him out in the spot. But if he doesn't, this will look to be like the Daniel Zauhuber fight. And I do trust Ignacio's ability to work back to his feet, even if he gets taken down in the second and third rounds. I think Klein has a better gas tank and better control than Yagos in deep waters. And that will allow Bahamunas to eventually work back to his feet, get back to his striking, chip away at the body of Yagos, and then finish him in the second or third round. Perfect way to play this fight, in my opinion. You can either parlay Bahamunas, play his round props round two or round three, and... Ensure you just hedge a little bit with Yagos round one knockout because that is his best opportunity of winning this matchup. But I'm going to go Bajo Mundes, third round uh, TKO. All right, moving over to the featherweight division. Very intriguing matchup here where we have Morgan Sherrier coming in at minus 120. He goes up against Chepe Mariscal, who comes in at plus 100. Now, there's been some solid action on Mariscal over the last couple of days, as I believe I did see him closer to plus 120 earlier this week, and it seems like the public is in love with him. Am I? Well, let's break this fight down. Cherrier is a guy that came into the UFC on a three-fight winning streak and had previously held the featherweight title over there in Cage Warriors. But after winning the Cage Warriors title... He ended up losing his next two matchups, which included losing the title and then losing the following matchup there, but then was given three solid opponent or, you know, regional journeymen who he was able to defeat. I believe he finished two out of three of those opponents uh, and then eventually got the call to the UFC, given the fact that the UFC was coming to Paris and they might as well take advantage of the popularity that Cherrier has been able to produce for himself over the last couple of years. But to me... He seems a fighter that is more hype than talent. Now, he's talented, don't get me wrong, but he is not a fighter that strikes me as somebody that will eventually make a title run. He's still only 28, so he might be able to improve his skill set and he might be able to become a better fighter, but I don't think he's at that stage of his career right now where he's going to be able to make a run into the top 15. At best, he's normally a low uh, pace, tepid kickboxer who likes to chip away at his opponents from distance, uh, has some decent grappling skills. If he has a big enough grappling edge over his opponents, he normally takes them to the ground and grinds them out. 
but I'm not impressed with much of his work. I, I think he has a bit of a cardio issue as well that he's been able to benefit from against guys that either don't have good enough gas tanks themselves or are unable to take advantage of the fact that Cherrier starts to slow down later on in his matchups. I thought he was given a complete softball in his UFC debut and a guy that was also making his UFC debut and probably doesn't deserve to be in the UFC to begin with. And he was able to finish him with a body kick and everybody going crazy over him. But I'm glad that the public is seeing the value in Chepe Mariscal, who is a better fighter, in my opinion, more battle-tested, and has way more experience at a higher level than what uh, we've seen from Sherrier. You know, Sherrier is a guy that has nine losses, right? This is not this, you know, this is not a guy that we have to be like, oh, look at the shiny new toy that the UFC has. Sure, he has a lot of Instagram followers, and he gets one of the biggest pops whenever the UFC goes to Paris, but... I don't know if his skill set is there to the point that he's going to be able to make it into the top 15. Now, let's talk about Mariscal, who's won both of his fights since coming into the UFC. It's unfortunate his last one against Jack Jenkins uh, was a, a fight that was stopped due to a, um, uh, I guess it was a verbal submission. Uh, but it, it was Jack Jenkins pretty much injuring his arm or breaking his arm when there was a trip that uh, Mariscal uh, brought into play and then that causes Jack Jenkins to get injured but Mariscal is a guy that's usually high output high volume has a very solid uh, wrestling game and striking game is getting up there as well the big question mark that I've had over with him over his last several fights is his durability it seems to be paying off right uh, I think it was the Joanderson Brito fight. I could be off on that, but uh, that was one of the scariest knockout losses I've ever seen. Mariscal was fighting the refs afterwards because he was so like out of it. Like it was just not a good look for him whatsoever. But he's recovered pretty well. He's 31 years old, hasn't been knocked out, hasn't been really showing any signs of having a horrible chin. And he's a guy that can go out there and just go to war like we saw in the fight against Trevor Peak. I think he has a better overall game here than Sherrier. And Sherrier could potentially hurt him. Sherrier could potentially put him away. That's absolutely on the table. But I think with Mariscal's style, I think that we'll see Mariscal take advantage of the fact that I think that Sherrier has a bit of a gas tank issue and he could potentially come away with a third round stoppage here, which currently st sits at plus 2,200 if you just take round three. So I think that we'll see more activity, more output, more damage from the Mariscal side. I think we'll see Mariscal try to get this into the grappling realm, uh, switch up the levels, you know what I mean, get some striking in there as well, but higher volume, more output, more activity. I expect this to be a Mariscal fight, and I expect him to likely... The official prediction is going to be by decision, but I will definitely be sprinkling sprinkling that plus 2200 for him to win in round three. It's going to be Mariscal and Mariscal by decision. All right, co-main event up next. This one should be a banger as well. Featherweight matchup between Alexander Hernandez, who comes in at minus 200, as he takes on Damon the Leech Jackson, who comes in at plus 175. We'll start off on Alexander Hernandez, who is going back down once again to featherweight, which is where he lost his last matchup to Bill Algio. Lost a matchup before that to Billy Quarantillo. Or sorry, at least the last time he was at 145. He took a short notice fight at 155 against Jim Miller and defeated him over the course of 15 minutes. But him down at 145 still gives me the heebie-jeebies. He's 31 years old. So like it's not like he's very old. So it shouldn't be super detrimental to him. But it looks like it takes a lot for him to, come to, to cut to 145 pounds and to still have as much success as he usually has at 155 pounds. We know he's physically gifted, very fast, very explosive, has a ton of power in his hands, has some decent grappling, but he's usually been coming up short against guys that are able to make him work, have uh, good range management, have better technical work than him, especially in the striking realm. That's how Bill Algio and Billy Quarantillo were able to defeat him, even Hanato Moicano. I don't see a bright future for him at 145 pounds, if I'm being honest. His opponent this weekend, Damon Deleach Jackson, is coming off of a two-fight losing streak right now, last time around being defeated by Billy Quarantillo, but he had a very solid start to that matchup. I thought he was running the first six or seven minutes of that fight before Quarantillo's gas tank came into play and Quarantillo's style of just really hitting the gas in rounds two and three. That allowed him to take over and really get the better of Damon Jackson winning that fight on the scorecards. We saw Dan Ige knock out Damon Jackson. I believe that happened in the second round. But Jackson is a guy that likes to utilize a grapple-heavy approach 
drowning his opponents with his wrestling, with his jiu-jitsu, usually finishing his opponents. He pretty much finished all of his fights before coming to the UFC. But recently, he's been going to a couple decisions. And I think it really comes down to the type of matchup that he has ahead of him. Now, in this fight against Hernandez, I think Jackson is going to struggle to close the distance effectively and try to get this fight to the ground. And that will allow Hernandez to really get off on his power and his explosivity, which I don't think that Jackson can really handle in the striking room. And I expect that to produce a Hernandez knockout. Out. But what I'm going to be looking to hone in on is the under two and a half, which is minus 170, a little bit chalky. But I believe the way that these guys match up should produce a finish. Whether it's Jackson with some gra- grappling dominance that could lead to a finish of some sort or a submission, or Hernandez landing a knockout, which I believe is the likelihood of the outcome between the two. Minus 200, a little bit too wide for me to take a shot on Hernandez. I wouldn't mind a Hernandez KO prop. But that's probably roughly around even money, so I don't want to be too privy on that. Jackson's submission might be a nice little poke, especially at some decent plus money. But I think violence is the spot here, under 2.5. Give me Hernandez and Hernandez by knockout. Main event time, finally. Feels like this podcast has been going on for a while, but I got a lot to say a lot about these matchups. Main event here, rematch, middleweight division. Brendan Allen coming in at minus 210, taking on Chris Curtis coming in at plus 180. Let's start off on the Brendan Allen side, who's currently riding a five-fight winning streak, last of which was probably the biggest one. It was a main event slot against Paul Craig, and he submitted him in the third round of a matchup where he just absolutely dominated him in the grappling room. And that's where we know Brendan Allen does his best work with his BJJ black belt. His striking is steadily improving and that's where he's really trying to really uh, assert himself because his wrestling still needs a little bit of work. But we saw in the Bruno Silva fight that his wrestling didn't work out for him, but he was able to drop Bruno Silva and eventually follow up with a submission after that. And that's how he was able to get the fight to the ground. If he continues to improve his striking game, he's going to be very difficult to deal with for a lot of fighters in the middleweight division because he's so dangerous when he's able to get fights to the mat. He's very good with getting to a dominant position and sinking in submissions to get his opponents out of there but it's really the striking that we need to hone in on and see if he's improved that enough so that he can get to the next level in this middleweight division the Marvin Vittori fight would have been a very intriguing one because I thought that he was the better technical fighter all around in that fight but Marvin Vittori was the highest level of opponent that he had fought to that point a guy that had previously fought for the middleweight title but I guess we'll never find out how that fight would have played out because of this uh, Vittori having to pull out of that fight but This is the perfect test for Brendan Allen to see if his striking has truly improved or not during the five-fight winning streak, considering he's going up against the guy who handed him his last loss and knocked him out as well. So let's talk about Chris Curtis, who's coming off of a decision victory over Marc-Andre Barrio, a fight that he pretty much dictated with his striking advantage. Barrio utilized a lot of distance uh, movement, uh, but anytime he was able to cross the pocket there, trying to get off on his own strikes, he was met with a combination from Curtis, and Curtis was obviously obviously the one landing more significant damage in that spot. Curtis is a guy that was a lifelong welterweight, but since coming to the UFC, has settled in at middleweight, and I think that's kind of been the downfall of his career at this point. However, there are certain fighters he's still able to go out there and beat. Right, he beat Brendan Allen, beat Mark Andre Barrio, beat Joaquin Buckley. His pocket exchanges, his durability, um, and his takedown defense improvements have allowed him to really just have fun in the pocket and in the striking range where he is most effective. And that's the puzzle that uh, Brendan Allen is going to have to solve here once again. And I don't think that Allen has made enough improvements in his game to try to you know, really work um, Curtis in spots that Curtis is uncomfortable with. Guys that have defeated Curtis are guys that can utilize distance striking uh, in a boring manner like Jack Hermanson did over the course of 15 minutes just chipping away at Curtis and not really engaging at all um, Calvin Gaslin that was a very weird back and forth matchup Nasruddin Imovov you know very high level striker from distance was pretty much piecing up Chris Curtis until that unfortunate I think it was a headbutt that caused a gash and eye issues for Curtis that caused that fight to go to an old contest but I thought that was the fight that Imovov was going on to win anyway But Brendan Allen doesn't have that level of striking, in my opinion. And even with the improvements that he's been making from the Chris Curtis fight, I don't know if it's enough to overcome what Curtis is going to present to him this weekend. So I think I'm going to go with Curtis again here, right? Brendan Allen was minus 350 going into the first fight. He's still the steady favorite here at minus 210, but I still think that line's a little bit too wide. His wrestling's not up there. 
So I think he's going to struggle to get Chris Curtis to the ground, conventionally speaking. And then the striking, Curtis has an ironclad chin. Brendan Allen's going to have to exchange in the pocket a couple times. And I find it hard to believe that he'll be able to come out unscathed over the course of 25 minutes without getting hurt badly once again. So I'm going to go with Curtis here. You know, rematches normally don't always go the same as the first fight, but considering the stylistic class that we have here and some of the shortcomings that Allen has with the wrestling and the striking realm, that will allow Curtis to get off on his strikes on the feet and eventually find that big shot to put Allen down once again. So I don't mind the underdog shot on Curtis, plus 170, plus 180. Curtis by knockout, I think that was sitting around plus 250. But I think we'll see the action man rise once again and knock out Brendan Allen probably in the second or third round. There you guys go. Breakdowns on all 12 fights for this UFC Vegas 90 card. Reminder, Victor Hugo might get a short notice replacement, so stay tuned later this week. If I if they do end up getting him a replacement, I'll drop a, another breakdown for that. Um, but also, tomorrow, aka Wednesday, Wednesday evening, I'll be dropping the PFL breakdown for you guys, so you guys are covered for that. Um, a ton of content coming to you guys this week. Make sure you guys check out all the content on the YouTube page, on the Patreon page. Enjoy it all. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace. Last thing.